Killer Psyche is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. When you're ready to pop the question, the last thing you want to do is second-guess the ring. At BlueNile.com, you can design a -a one-of-a-kind ring with the ease and convenience of shopping online. Choose your diamond and setting. When you found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Go to BlueNile.com and use promo code AUDIO to get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's code AUDIO at BlueNile.com for $50 off your purchase. BlueNile.com, code AUDIO. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. During the early 1980s in Florida, a serial rapist was terrorizing young women, sneaking into their homes, mostly through unlocked windows or doors. The victims told police that the man threatened them with a sharp object and then tied their hands. The attacker demanded that they not look at him and covered their faces with a pillowcase, earning him the nickname, the Pillowcase Rapist. His last known attack occurred in February 1986. The rapist, who is estimated to have at least 44 victims, had vanished. And after a year of searching, the case had gone cold. That is until Labor Day weekend 2019, when a 28-year-old man kicked in the door of his girlfriend's home and was arrested for assault and burglary. His DNA was taken and it matched a sample taken from a crime scene involving the pillowcase rapist. But the 28-year-old was not alive when the series of rapes occurred. However, his 63-year-old father, Robert Kohler, was. The elder Kohler's DNA was a 100% match to the pillowcase rapist and he was arrested on January 19th, 2020. In January of 2023, he was convicted and sentenced to 17 years for a rape in 1983. Other charges are still pending. Today's headline is courtesy of Channel 4, CBS Miami. A man who police say brutalized dozens of women in South Florida in the 1980s is under arrest tonight. 60-year-old Robert Kohler became known as the pillowcase rapist. He's now in jail in Brevard County. According to our news partners of the Miami Herald, authorities found the registered sex offender thanks to a DNA match. He's suspected of raping at least 44 women at knife point while using a pillowcase or similar item to hide his face. Today, we are speaking with David Schutz, the senior editor of The Sun Sentinel and the host of the podcast, Felonious Florida, which is now in its fourth season. This season focuses on Florida's pillowcase rapist, which is what we will be discussing today. So, David, what have the police learned about Robert Eugene Kohler's background? He was adopted, and at around age seven, his father took off, left his wife and his young son at home. He was an only child. Beyond that, the police don't know a whole lot about Kohler because Kohler himself doesn't like to talk about it. I spoke to him 
uh, from jail a few times, and uh, he's very difficult to talk to. He doesn't give away any personal information. He's very secretive. He's a paranoid person. He dropped out of school in middle school, and he was a tow truck driver. He was always a volatile person, as he's described. He's had run-ins with police. So there were signs before the rapes began Mm -hmm. that he had a lot of anger in him. You mentioned he was paranoid. Now, is that a clinical diagnosis he has been given, or is it your observation of him? That's a good question, and it's my observation of him. I haven't seen any clinical diagnosis of him, but in my conversations with him, he's full of conspiracy theories. He's paranoid. He's agitated, short-tempered, lashes out, and, and that's just my observation. How many rapes do they think he's good for? What they will say is dozens, right? What we've known historically about the pillowcase rapist is the number 44. He was very prolific, and none of the victims had ever seen his face. And then in 1986, he broke into the apartment of a woman who kept her wits about her and was able to trick him into believing that she couldn't see without her glasses. Um, I'm blind as a bat. That's specifically what she said to him. And so he did not conceal his identity from her. And he proceeded to rape her. And she got a really good look at his face. And from that, a police sketch artist was able to create a rendering of him. They created a three-dimensional bust. The investigators got very aggressive with this sketch because it was the big break that they had been hoping for Mm -hmm. all along. So it went to the media. Flyers were printed by the hundreds of thousands and distributed across South Florida. And that was the last time the pillowcase rapist ever struck. So the thinking at the time was the publicity might have spooked him. Mm -hmm. Um, He may have left the area. Maybe he died. Maybe he was incapacitated in some way. They didn't know. What was going on that we know of in his life that he stopped? voluntarily, apparently. What we know is that the rape stopped in 1986. Kohler was employed. He was still living in his apartment in South Miami. But around the same time that they stopped, he abruptly packed up his apartment and moved further north in South Florida into Palm Beach County. Why? We don't know. But he continued working as an electrician. He met a woman who got pregnant with Kohler's son. They ended up getting married, and she got pregnant with Kohler's daughter. So he was now at this time starting to build a family. But after his 2020 arrest, told police that it was not a good marriage. It was quickly over. Well, how could it not be? The guy's a serial rapist. He abuses women. (laughs) I can't even imagine him having a... A, a good marriage. Yeah. You you mentioned his arrest in, in 2020. How did that come about? Now there's DNA being used in every investigation. Mm-hmm. And in 2019, Kohler's son was in his early 20s and got in an argument with his girlfriend. And it turned a little bit physical. And his girlfriend fled into her house. And the younger Robert Kohler, they have the same name, kicked in the door to his girlfriend's house. As soon as he did that, he was committing a felony. The son was arrested, and now anyone who's arrested and charged with a felony has their DNA taken and entered into a database. And his DNA came back as a match to the pillowcase rapes from the early 1980s. But of course, he wasn't born in the 1980s, so how could this be? Mm -hmm. The only answer was that the DNA of the pillowcase rapist belonged to his father, Mm -hmm. Robert Eugene Kohler. Mm -hmm. And so that's enough for investigators to get a warrant to try to collect more specific DNA from the now suspect. Mm -hmm. And so they began following Robert Eugene Kohler around, waiting for an opportunity to collect DNA. They got one at a Walmart when they watched Kohler go in and use a disinfectant wipe to wipe off his shopping cart. As soon as he did that, (laughs) investigators were at the trash can where he threw that wipe, took it out, got it to the lab, did a test. It came back as a match. So he has now been 
fitted for a pair of handcuffs as a result of medical biotechnology, the DNA. Does he have anything to say? I mean, is he saying you got the wrong guy or is he just zipped up or what? He is absolutely not zipped up. He is very talkative, more talkative than he probably should be. But as I said to you at the start of our conversation, he has a lot of conspiracies rolling around in his head. He believes that the government has been watching him for decades, that he's been framed for these crimes, Mm. that the serial rapes themselves were pegged on him as a way for law enforcement in Miami-Dade County to say there's a serial rapist and get more funding. All of these bizarre conspiracy theories that he, he spouts off. So at the same time, he's denying that he was the guy who did this. Mm -hmm. He's also saying, I was framed and made to do things that I didn't want to do. He's saying he was framed and the police made him rape women? Is that where we're at? (laughs) Not not his exact words, but that's absolutely what he's implying. I thought I heard it all, but (laughs) that's a new one. You've interacted with him. Do you think this paranoia, the police framed me and they made me do things. Is that BS or does he believe that? I think he believes that. And I would say it's BS if he just started talking like that now. But the people that I talked to who had interacted with him before his arrest and and the revelation that he is the pillowcase rapist say that he had the same conspiracy theories, obviously not specific to these crimes, but that the government was watching him, that they were out for him. And so even though he wasn't talking specifically about these crimes, I think there are indications that as the years went on for this man, that his mental condition was deteriorating. And in fact, so much so that in in the last hearing that I went to in early May 2024, Kohler began yelling profanities at the prosecutor, calling her evil. The judge had him taken out of the courtroom. He was wheeled out in his wheelchair. And the prosecutor immediately asked for a new mental health evaluation. This would have been a second one to determine his competency to stand trial. So it'll be interesting to see what that report says. That'll answer the question really about just how much he believes his own conspiracy theories. I find it hard to believe, and I come from a clinical background before I was an agent, I find it hard to believe that somebody seriously mentally ill, an ill enough that prosecutors are ordering new psyche valves on him, that he could have been, uh, could he have been a prolific rapist? Yes. Would he likely have been caught because his mental state would have resulted in him being careless and and uh, getting caught because of leaving evidence, this, that, and the other? That's possible. But there's no way someone uh, could have been that mentally disturbed 30 years ago. What we're talking about here is a paranoid delusion that he has, and apparently this has been going on for a while. The government's after me. They framed me. The police made me do things sexually to these women I didn't want to do. Had that state of mind existed 30 years ago, there wouldn't have been, what, 44, a minimum, 44 rapes without him being caught. I mean, he was caught accidentally. It, it was absolutely a stroke of luck. And this is absolutely your area more than mine. But if you took all these things that he was doing kind of on their own, not knowing his history and what he's been accused of, you would say, well, he's a survivalist, right? He believes in government conspiracies and that he's being watched. He had cameras mounted all over his house. He had water collection. He had power sources um, off the grid and he he was collecting things his house was was an absolute mess and well that stands to reason because his mind is his and what i mean by that he it's sounding like he had well definitely paranoid delusions possibly extending into a thought disorder and people that are suffering from either serious clinical depression uh, paranoid delusions their habitat is usually a reflection of what's going on in their head. And by that, I mean a hot mess. Mental illnesses, if he had one then, he was in control of it. They get worse without treatment or medication 
as an individual gets older, the mental illness gets worse, not better. Yeah, and that is absolutely not the same person who was committing these rapes back in the 1980s. This no. guy was able to evade capture. That's not easy to do. There were, at the peak of the investigation, there were 60 investigators assigned to the task force looking for this one individual. Wow. You can't escape that un unless you're very tricky and you're smart. And investigators said they believed he was probably an intelligent person back then. To be able to stalk his victims and get in and out without any, not just the, the, the victim, but witnesses. Nobody ever saw him coming or going from any of the apartments that he attacked. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And that is not the person who's sitting in jail today. No, it isn't. David, I really enjoyed your podcast. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about your season four. Thank you, Candace, and thank you so much for having me on Killer Psyche. If you would like to listen to David's podcast, Felonious Florida, we will have a link in our episode description.